My name is Gary Francione. I am a Board of Governors Distinguished Professor of Law and the Nicholas de B. Katzenbach Scholar of Law and Philosophy at Rutgers University here in Newark. And as you can tell, uh, academic institutions like long titles. I have one such long title. I started teaching about animal rights theory in 1984 when I was teaching at the University of Pennsylvania. I was teaching a course in legal theory that dealt with issues of focused on human rights issues and I brought animal rights into that and and uh, and it, as far as I know that was the, really the first time that anybody was really sort of linking those issues in that sort of context and talking about animal rights theory I was distinguishing from animal welfare and focusing on the idea that animals could have moral and legal rights and and um, you know why I chose to do it at that time was I had become a vegan in 1982 uh, by 1984 by the beginning of my academic career I was um, I was pretty deeply involved with a lot of uh, a lot of animal advocacy issues, uh, and so you know it seemed a natural thing to do to bring that into the classroom, uh, and you know and and uh, in 1989 when I came to Rutgers, uh, we started uh, the animal rights law clinic uh, with um, my colleague and partner Anna Charlton. We started the, uh, the the animal rights clinic, which was the first of its kind anywhere in the world, where we gave students six academic credits in a semester for working on real cases involving animal rights issues but also you know they, they would take a, a, a seminar for two credits on animal rights theory and animal rights and the law and whatnot so they, they, they did they, they spent some of the time in the classroom but they worked with us on cases most of our cases dealt with human rights issues that involved animals. So we were representing students who didn't want to dissect or vivisect in the classroom. We represented people who wanted to uh, protest or have demonstrations about veganism or animal rights but were being prohibited from doing so, so their free, free speech rights were being uh, violated. And so we, we it's always it's been my position that the law is you know animals are property and you know the law is not going to change the status of animals as property what the law can do is the law can focus on certain human rights issues which involve animals and then help bring the animal rights issue into focus through the human through the through, through the human rights case and that's what we did uh, and you know I still continue to believe that the 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 legal system is never going to do anything in terms of changing the status of animals that's got to come from a paradigm shift in the in the moral thinking of the society. The law is not going to lead that. The law will follow that, but that's got to happen first. We've got to have a significant number of people who buy into veganism as a as a as a moral imperative and as a baseline before you're ever going to see the legal system do anything even remotely interesting. Until that time, uh, I think the legal system is is relegated to focusing on cases involving human rights that 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 involve animal issues. At the World Vegan Summit, I'm going to be doing several things. I'm, I'm going to be doing a presentation, uh, I believe, right at the opening of the conference on the abolitionist approach to animal rights, and then I'm going to be doing some workshops with animal advocates. But with respect to the introduction to the abolitionist approach to animal rights, that's something I'm going to be doing with my partner, Anna Charlton, and we're going to be talking about uh, what the abolitionist approach means uh, and, and, and talk about its central principles, the idea that uh, animals have, have a right not to be regarded as property or treated as property, that uh, w we focus on, on abolishing exploitation, not regulating it, the relationship between human rights and animal rights, and most importantly, the idea that veganism is the moral baseline. It's a, if you're going to have an animal rights movement, veganism has got to be the moral baseline. And I think we've lost sight of that. I think a lot of animal advocates you know, talk about humane exploitation. That's like talking about humane slavery. And that, um, and that we really want to focus on, you know, veganism is the one thing everybody can do. You don't need a, a compl you know, you don't need an expensive campaign. You don't need the backing of anybody. You don't need a law. You don't need any sort. It's a decision you make. 
and 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 so what what we're going to be talking about is the importance of veganism uh, and and how veganism really represents sort of a, a of an act of defiance it's an act of saying no I'm not going to participate in the exploitation of the vulnerable that, that I, I refuse to participate in that so and, and then edu in educating others about veganism the importance of that so we're going to we're going to talk about that you know it's it's interesting because in the 1990s uh, people talked about animal rights but what what happened was animal rights was a term that got appropriated by welfareists that is people who promoted welfare reform said well we're really animal rights people but we believe we ought to get to animal rights by incremental welfareist steps and 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 I rejected that then um but what happened was now uh, you know the, cons the 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 notion of animal rights has been so much appropriated by the welfareists that animal rights as a term really doesn't mean anything anymore. I mean, you know, uh, 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 veal producers use it. They say, well, I respect the rights of animals and I think that we ought to give them more space and things like that. So, you know, whenever you start having institutional users who are talking about animal rights, you know that the concept of, has lost its core meaning. And and so when, um, when I started uh, the, the abolitionist approach, it was largely because I used abolition, which I've always been used, I've always used that word um, in the context of talking about animal rights, but now I made the concept of abolition front and center because uh, I, I, I judged that the concept of animal rights really had lost um, it, you know, any, sort of, any sort of meaning. I mean, it had lost any sense of meaning. And that um, we, we needed a new word. We needed a new word to focus people's attention. Um, and, and I chose abolition. Uh, interestingly, a lot of welfareists now are trying to appropriate that and say, well, we're welfareists, but we're really abolitionists at heart. We just think that welfareism ought to be used to, to um, you know, get to abolition. So, um, and eventually, in another 10 years, abolition will probably have lost its meaning and I'll have to think of something else. But uh, for the time being, I'm focusing on abolition because it really, abolition really is the core concept of what the animal rights notion was. I mean, I mean animal, wh when we were talking about animal rights, uh, although it was a somewhat um, uh, uh, undefined notion in many ways in the um, in the 80s and early 90s, but the concept of abolition was 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 emerging from that from animal rights. Um, the problem is it never really um, animal rights never really became sufficiently developed because it became basically overshadowed by the 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 welfareist organizations who appropriated that word now actually you know interestingly the word is just sort of you know uh, now everybody any anybody who's talking about anything related to animal ethics talks about animal rights it's really lost its its meaning as a as a as a paradigm shifting moral and legal concept and so what i'm doing now is focusing on abolition and so we'll be talking about about what abolition means and why the regula why, why the regulation of animal exploitation is a bad idea morally and practically it's a moral morally it's a bad idea it's speciesist practically it's a bad idea it can't work because animals are chattel property and i also think the movement has lost track of the relationship between human rights and animal rights you know, not that it's ever been that that um, respectful of that of that relationship. I mean, the the movement has always really been focused on animal issues in large part because the the groups, the animal groups, focus on the animal issue and they want to stay. They don't want to they don't want to become politically controversial. I have the the advantage of not being not having any group or any group of donors to worry about. And I think that it's imperative that we link the human rights issues and the animal rights issues, which I've been doing since 1984 when I first started teaching this stuff. Um, I've been linking the human rights issues and the animal rights issues. I reject sexism. I reject heterosexism. I reject racism. And I think that, you know, look, the, the reality is speciesism is wrong because it's like these other forms of discrimination. It otherizes non-human animals in the same way that racism, sexism, heterosexism, classism otherizes other groups of human beings. If we reject speciesism because it's bad like these other forms of discrimination, we have taken a position, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, we, we must take a position that these other forms of discrimination are also wrong. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be talking, you know, we're going to be talking a lot about that. The other thing that I'm going to be doing at the summit is a couple of grassroots workshops. I, I think that the, uh, 
that many people who are attracted to the abolitionist approach and many people who will be at the summit are people who uh, agree with the position that I've been arguing now for a number of years that these large organizations are largely they're counterproductive they're 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 kind of it's not that they're not they're not pushing things ahead fa they're pushing things backward uh, I think that that you know uh, organizations like PETA HSUS compassion over killing mercy for animals uh, and again I'm not questioning the, the sincerity of those people but I think that um, their 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 basic strategy and the way that they go about things is just completely wrong they're promoting happy exploitation I think that that's wrong uh, I think that the whole happy exploitation movement has has been a, a dramatic back a, a, a really a backward step and a serious backward step uh, for those of us who care about uh, uh, animal ethics and animal rights and, and abolition and so um, what what we need to do is we need to sort of just forget about those groups and we need to develop a new form of grassroots advocacy that works around that just ignores them we we're never we're never going to have good campaigns that will be part of what they're doing because what they're doing is trying to legitimize exploitation and promote this idea that we can be compassionate exploiters of animals. Th that's just wrong. And so what we need to do is develop a style of advocacy outside of that, that framework. And, and so that's what we're going to be doing. Um, I'm bringing together a number of people uh, who have had experience in doing grassroots advocacy and, um, and, and abolitionist advocacy. Uh, and uh, and they're going to be be there, and they're going to be sharing their experiences, and we're going to I, I think do some role play. Um, I was thinking that perhaps one of the things we haven't completely uh, finalized what what we're going to do at these sessions, but one of the things I was thinking of doing is sort of doing a very brief sort of presentation of what I do when I talk to groups of non-animal people about animal issues. You know how to teach people about the animal. The, you know about about abolition uh, without ever really getting into you know anything complicated or into you know talking about abolition in any sort of formal way but just talking about the whole animal you know about about the abolition of exploitation without getting deeply philosophical or 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 you know uh, uh, into the into the politics of the rights welfare movement you know that's helpful to some sometimes to discuss but but you know just focusing on we think animals matter. If we think animals matter, the one thing that's clear is that we can't continue to eat them, wear them, and use them. Just getting those, you know, that simple idea across to people um, and, and making it clear to people that most people you talk to already believe what they need to believe to get them to go vegan. That's the irony. The, the, the irony of it is we're not taking... I'm not taking an extreme position. What I'm doing is trying to get people, trying to get people in the public who say they care about animals, who say that they regard animals as members of the moral community, who say that they reject the idea that animals are simply things, to recognize that what that means is that they're committed to going vegan. So it's not that I am extreme in promoting veganism as a moral baseline. It's they're extreme in not following through in a behavioral sense with what they claim and I believe most of them do believe in a conceptual sense and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that these large organizations are telling people you don't have to be vegan if you care about animals there are other things that you can do and they portrayed veganism as a way of reducing suffering so well we've got cage-free eggs and we've got crate-free pork and we've got veganism these are all ways of of reducing suffering and what what we need to do is sort of just choose one and we shouldn't criticize anybody for choosing any other one and my view is no 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 it's veganism is not simply a way of reducing suffering veganism is a it, it is about reducing suffering but it is more at its base a a principle of justice a rejection of exploitation I mean the bottom line is I don't care how well you treat them I don't care how humanely you treat them and I don't think you will treat them very humanely because their status of as, as chattel property will always militate in favor of a very low standard of animal welfare but I don't care how well you treat them it's wrong to use them as our resources however well we treat them a fundamental principle of justice you know if I'm going to kill you and I sneak into your, your room uh, tonight while you're sleeping and I put a bullet in your head and you don't feel anything and I kill you painlessly, that's better than torturing you, but it's still wrong. And so 
the idea of this will be how do you teach this to people and you know how do you get these ideas across to to members of the general public and the answer is it's not as, as difficult as as it, it would seem because most members of the general public already believe they already believe everything they need to believe to go vegan the problem is they've had animal quote animal people end quote telling them they don't have to go vegan that they can they can be be compassionate exploiters or they can go to Whole Foods and buy you know level five uh, you know or level three or whatever you know, whatever the level of animal the animal welfare rating level is they can buy happy meat and happy eggs and happy happy dairy and they can they can discharge their obligations to animals their moral obligations to animals and one of the things we have to be clear on is no you can't you can't if animals matter then drinking, you know, organic or, you know, happy milk or, you know, eating cage-free eggs or eating happy meat is not discharging your obligations. Uh, it's violating, you know, it's violating their, the, the rights of those animals and it's ignoring the obligations that you have. And so we're going to be talking to, to, to people about how to educate in that respect. You know, there are, there are you know, and, and, and we're going to also have a session in which we're going to talk about the sorts of objections that people raise um, and you know how to deal with family members and friends you know and things like that just some practical uh, advocacy advice coming not only from me and from Anna Charlton but from other really really good people who will be at the conference um, like Jeff Purs and Vincent Kahane and, uh, and Vera Cristofani and people like that who have been doing that sort of vegan advocacy for some years now. I became a vegetarian in 1978. I visited a slaughterhouse. Uh, I have no idea what went on in the slaughterhouse, so I, I saw one and I stopped eating meat. Uh, I ate fish, I think, for another year until I read something about fish being able to feel pain, so I stopped eating fish. And I'd never actually, in 1978-79, I'd never heard the word vegan. And um, I, I met someone in 1982 who told me about veganism and um, that was it. Uh, okay. Not at all. Yeah, sure. I became uh, a vegetarian in 1978. I visited a slaughterhouse and I stopped eating meat, all meat, immediately. I still continued to eat fish for another year or so until I read something about fish being able to feel pain. And so I stopped eating fish. I had never heard the word vegan up to that point. I had never, I'd never heard the word vegan. I'd never, I'd, if you had asked me in 1979, 1980, what's a vegan, I would say, I don't know. Now, obviously, Donald Watson had coined the term in 1944, but I really was not familiar with, with I, I, I didn't know what a vegan was. And I thought that if you stopped eating dairy and eggs, because what happened was when I stopped eating meat, I r increased my intake of dairy and eggs. And so I thought, well, you know, I mean, I'm not eating meat, but, you know, I'm eating this stuff, so, you know, I'll get my protein. And, um, and then I met someone in 1982 who uh, educated me about veganism, and I became a vegan immediately. I mean, it wasn't something that I transitioned into. I mean, I had a discussion with somebody uh, on, a, uh, on a Friday night in, you know, October of 1982, and on Saturday I was a vegan. And, and I've also, uh, you know, I w my partner became a vegetarian with me, and we became vegans together because she had never heard of, of, of what, you know, she, neither of us was, was aware. Uh, both of us, I think, thought that you would really jeopardize your health if you stopped eating all animal protein. Little did we realize that you jeopardize your health if you don't. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so we became vegans, we became vegetarians together, we became vegans together, and we've been vegan since, you know, 1982. Uh, and why I think it is important. I mean, I think that, um, I think veganism is the single most important thing that anybody can do who says they care about animals. If you say you care about animals, it's not a question whether you love them or not. I mean, you know, uh, that, that's irrelevant. I mean, what's, what's relevant is do you think that they're members of the moral community? Do you believe they have moral value or do you think that they are just things that exist as our resources? Those are the only two choices. Do they have moral value or are they things that have no moral value and that exist only as resources? If they have moral value, then we have no right to be eating them, wearing them, using them, exploiting them in any way. Uh, then, you know, if, if they have 
moral personhood, as it were. It doesn't mean that they're human. It just means that they're moral persons, i.e., they count morally. If they count morally, we cannot justify eating them, wearing them, using them. And so I think veganism, I see veganism as basically the baseline. I mean, it, it, it's we may have other obligations to animals. We may have to go further than being vegan. We may have to do other things. But if animals matter morally, the least that we can do and the, the least that we're obligated to do is to go vegan. And so uh, I think, you know, and I think that veganism in many ways is, is um, it's important not just for how we feel about animals, but I think that it's important to, you know, many of us claim uh, to care about nonviolence. Well, you know, if you're, if you're putting violence into your mouth, words of nonviolence coming out of your mouth really don't make a lot of sense. And so, um, you know, I, I, I see veganism as, as really representing uh, the principle of nonviolence applied to others, non-human animals who are sentient, to ourselves. We have an obligation to ourselves not to harm ourselves, and I think that by consuming animal products we do so. And we have an obligation to all sentient beings who depend on the environment, human and non-human animals who depend on the environment, animal agriculture is destroying the planet. So, you know, I mean, it's not that I think that rocks or trees themselves have any sorts or plants have any sorts of rights because they're not sentient beings. But there are humans and non-humans that depend on those water bodies and plants and, and trees and whatnot. And we have an obligation to all sentient beings. And the, and the, the, the environment is being devastated by animal agriculture. So I see um, veganism as a real, as representing a real commitment to nonviolence to others, to self, to the environment. And, and I think that, you know, uh, you certainly have to, you, you know, uh, veganism is not sufficient to be, to, to be living a nonviolent life. That is, you have to do more, I think, than be vegan to really live a nonviolent life. But veganism is necessary to a nonviolent life. It may not be sufficient, but it certainly is necessary. And so I see, you know, and I see veganism really um, as, as the individuals saying no to, to, bull, to being a bully, no to exploiting the vulnerable. You know, I mean, it's a, it really is um, an act of defiance. It's an act of nonviolent defiance saying, I've been taught to exploit animals. I've been taught that, you know, that animals don't matter, and I'm rejecting that. And one rejects that uh, by going vegan. I'm hoping that the World Vegan Summit and Expo will uh, be uh, the sort of kickoff event of the grassroots movement that is going to put aside all of these, is going to reject all of this animal welfare regulation, all this happy exploitation, and, and we're going to see a paradigm shift in terms of animal advocates recognizing that um, we don't need the large groups. We don't need any groups. This is something, if, if we're going to change this, this is something that we're going to change as individuals. Uh, first and foremost, we have to become vegans. And then we have to educate ourselves so we can educate others, but that this is going to be a grassroots effort. But that we can, we can change the world if we want. But we have to want to do it, and we have to work toward it. You know, uh, there have been some. Uh, there, there was an interesting study that came out of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute uh, last year or the year before. I don't remember which. Uh, in which some, um, some some folks, some some academics there, studied social movements, and what they concluded was that if you have 10 percent of a population that believes very strongly in something, uh, it it results in change. Now, if we had 10 percent of our population completely devoted. And, and, you know, devoted to abolitionist veganism. I'm not talking about veganism as, you know, as, as, as a way of reducing suffering uh, that's like cage-free eggs and crate-free pork. I'm talking about really committed to the idea that we cannot justify, cannot morally justify using animals. If you had 10% of the population that embraced that idea, it wouldn't mean that everybody would become veganism, vegan uh, immediately. That's, it, it would not. But what it would do is it would change the dialogue, which is what we need to do right now when we talk about animals in the, the general population, we're, we're talking about issues of treatment. That is, most people believe that it's all right to use them as long as we treat them all right. 
And what, what we need to do is to shift that to, to, to focusing on the question of use, that we can't justify using them however well we treat them. I mean, obviously, we need to understand that we're never going to treat them really well because they're chattel property. And, and it costs money to protect their interests, and we generally protect their interests when we get a benefit, usually an economic one, from doing so. So the level of animal welfare is always, as a practical matter, going to be very, very low. But the, 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 mor the, 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 the moral issue here is that that if animals matter, we can't be using them. We can't be killing them. We can't be, you know, bringing them into existence and, and making them suffer. Even if we make them suffer left, less, we bring them into existence, we make them suffer to a greater or lesser degree, and then we kill them. We can't be doing that. And so if we, if we had 10% of the population that, that understood that uh, and embraced that, what would happen is you would see a change in the discussion. We would be talking about the use of animals and we'd be moving away from this idea of, well, you know, if you make the factory farm a little better, if you get rid of what these organizations call the, quote, worst abuses, end quote, uh, then, you know, then it's okay. If you get, you know, if you go and you buy it at Whole Foods or some other, you know, some other, you know, purveyor of happy death, um, then it's okay. And, and so I, I think that, you know, and, and that's what I'm hoping the conference is going to do, is going to get animal advocates to realize that um, that we don't need the large organizations and indeed the large organizations have been very harmful in terms of progress that what we need to do is recognize that if this is ever going to change it's going to change as a result of a grassroots effort as a as a result of of people who are really firmly committed to this idea really embrace this idea working within their communities educating their families their friends and 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 you know and educating themselves as to how to educate because I think that's an important thing you know that you, you don't you don't just go out and start talking about it I mean people have to recognize that you don't have to get a, a doctorate in philosophy before you go out and talk about it but you do have to educate yourself before you go out and educate other people but the, the whole point of the summit's going to be um, we need a grassroots movement we need an intelligent grassroots an, art, an intelligent articulate grassroots movement that can go out there and educate people and 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 get them to see that they really believe you know everything they need to believe to go vegan and that that the ideas that we're articulating are not extreme ideas if anything what's extreme is that we teach our children to love animals at the same time that we teach them that eating them and, and exploiting them is okay. So we're teaching our children that loving and harming and exploitation are consistent. That's extreme. You know, the, it, what's extreme is that we say we, we care and that we regard animals as members of the moral community, but we continue to exploit them. That's extreme. And so what we need to do is to sort of just inject some common sense into this and to sort of and, and, and to educate people about how veganism is, is what we all have. Those, any of us, who, who accepts that, that, that animals are members of the moral community and, and that they're not just things. You're committed. You're, you're committed to the idea of veganism. The World Vegan Summit and Expo, March 20th through the 22nd at the Marina del Rey Marriott. Register now at worldvegansummit.com.